check. All right, folks, uh, I think we are live. Uh, fantastic. Thanks for joining. Um, it's a, a pleasure to, to speak to you all today and uh, sort of uh, culminate the, a, res a research project that I had over the last year. Um, and we're just going to launch right into it. So my name is Seth, Sar Seth Carmody, and this is uh, why healthcare cybersecurity is hard. Uh, for those who, folks who uh, don't know me, I spent eight years at the FDA. Uh, I am a former chemist, as is evidenced by this uh, picture here, uh, turned tech policy architect, uh, working on some of the uh, cybersecurity guidances that we'll be talking about today that came from FDA's Center for Devices. I joined Medicrypt in 2020, um, and I'm working on the problem from a different angle. Um, and wh where did we start? Uh, so I started this uh, talk uh, back in right around a year ago, which is really interesting and, and some, somewhat cathartic, uh, 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 titled slightly differently, Why is Healthcare Security Hard? Um, asking the question, really. Asking, the first talk they ever gave, just asking a question I didn't know the answer to. Sorry for the uh, uh, lack of pixels in the screen grab here. Um, but the idea was, why is this hard? Why is cybersecurity hard for folks? Um, very big question, and I, I meant that from the healthcare vertical space, I meant that from just a general space. I was inspired by uh, a paper by Ross Anderson that came out in 2001, basically saying, why is information security hard? And I, I endeavored to dive deep uh, into everything that I knew and what, what was out there and other people knew to figure out and put together sort of the axioms or root causes of why it was hard for us in the healthcare space so that we could focus our attention on fixing those specific problems and, and be catalytic uh, and not spend our time on other things that were not catalytic. That was the goal. And the, I, I love this uh, screen grab here because 965 views. This is like the, this is like the, the incoherent ramblings of a madman uh, data metrics from, from YouTube. 23 thumbs up, three thumbs down, which I always find interesting, but I digress. We can talk about that later. So the, the idea that, uh, and this may be obvious to, to folks, but I want to make sure we drive the point home is that, and this never changes, um, healthcare optimizes for healthcare. Uh, we're, uh, folks in healthcare aren't, aren't in business necessarily, um, uh, won't be in business long if they don't focus on delivering healthcare features that improve uh, you know, quality of life or life sustaining, life saving um, in, in all of those uh, various areas. Um, conversely, and I like to compare it to the finance sector where we think about uh, the incentives that are in imposed on a bank and, and how they protect their assets, uh, whether physical or digital, and the idea that if they don't use uh, security or have security as a core competency, that transactions in, you know, in the billions of dollars can be lost uh, in, in the blink of an eye. And um, that, that uh, so we, we must always remember that healthcare optimizes for healthcare. That that can never change. Otherwise, we're not healthcare, and we don't have the ideas, the concept of healthcare. And, and no, uh, <laughs> we're sort of an interesting time that sort of plays this out. And that is that we're in this time where absolutely uh, healthcare needs to be focused on healthcare. If you look at the absolute, I mean, the incredible uh, uh, resource consumption that has to go into a pandemic response. You cannot, uh, it, it, it becomes very clear that healthcare must optimize and focus on healthcare. So, so what is this, what, what is the effect, uh, what is the effect of this state? Um, the effect is that because we're all, and this is not pejorative by any stretch, we're all focused on delivering healthcare features. Um, we have what's called a technical debt or a subset of that, which I refer to as security debt in the white paper. And what happens is you enter a state where uh, consumers, be it HDOs, healthcare delivery organizations, clinicians, patients, are responsible uh, for managing the security debt which enters their, uh, which enters their four walls um, instead of reducing security debt, which is where we ultimately want to go. Um, and, and they spend a lot of money to do this. They spend a lot of money to manage that security debt to the tune of $20 billion, $10 to $20 billion a year. Um, but, uh, but, but we, we see the evidence of that not necessarily working. 10 to $20 billion spent uh, literally from this month, this week, yeah, yeah this week, uh, we hear reports of 
uh, healthcare breaches. And again, this is not to slam Scripps or this Nevada hospital, right? It's basically saying you're spending a lot of money, but because we're just managing security debt, we are going to, and because adversaries exist, we, we will experience problems. The consumers will experience the problems. In fact, if you look at the uh, risk-based securities 2021 mid-year report, it says healthcare uh, by far is the most breach uh, economic vertical. And again, it's, it's not because people don't care. It's because we're optimizing for security. Security debt accrues, uh, adversaries exist, and problems manifest. Um, the problem is that we're all focused on healthcare security. We have this collection of security debt. It's a lot like uh, environmental pollution. So I'd like to use the example of polychloral biphenyls or PCBs in the Hudson. We have electronics manufacturers that are making consumer goods. Consumers are buying those electronic products, not necessarily on how a uh, manufacturer uh, reduces their, their um, pollution uh, in the production of that process. In fact, it may be even not hidden in a pejorative sense, but it just may not be uh, the consumer may not be aware or have any information to make purchasing decisions on the environmental impact of that manufacturer. And that's referred to as the tragedy of the commons or in economic parlance, uh, the uh, a negative externality. So what happens when there are negative externalities in the marketplace? How do you incent uh, producers to reduce, uh, say, pollution in this case or security debt in the specific cybersecurity case? You enter the regulator. So this is a perfect example where the Environmental Protection Agency comes in and says, hey, like this, we have to figure out a way to reduce uh, the use of or disposal of PCBs uh, in, into the environment. Uh, and what do regulators do? They regulate. Um, by the way, uh, if we look at the metrics uh, on YouTube here, we've got right, 250 million uh, hits for Warren G's regulate. By the way, if anybody, uh, extra credit bonus points, you can name what year without going to the internet for us. I can't verify if you do or not what year the song came out, but it's clear that I have a lot to do uh, to be, uh, uh, to have the notoriety of, of Warren G. Anyway, so regulators regulate. So yeah, we talked about the EPA. Uh, there are lots of different regulators. We'll, we'll speak to that in a second, but what we're going to fo focus principally on in this talk is the U.S. Food and Drug Administration, my alma mater. When you have negative externality, when you have tragedy to commons, when you have security debt that's passing down, uh, in the supply chain to consumers, uh, this is a, a primary job of the regulator. And if you if you sort of step back from the, the security aspects of what we're going to be talking about today and sort of ask the question, <clears throat> why does the regu regulator exist um, in, in, the, in the context of the FDA? Their, their call to action, right, is reasonable assurance of safety and efficacy. Um, this is a, a reasonable framework for the regulator to exist because you can imagine that if a consumer, right, was charged with making these, you know, making these uh, conclusions uh, on whether a device or a medical product was safe and efficacious, it was kind of ridiculous, right? So if I'm in a hospital scenario, uh, maybe an emergency room scenario, and I go to use a, you know, a medical product, um, I, I, I want, as a physician, say, if I'm, I'm using this, uh, I don't know, a, a diff external defibrillator, I don't want to be asking myself, "Hey, is this thing going to work, or is this, this, you know, is this optim optimized?" You, know, you, you want to just have that out of the way, right? So the the FDA serves as a uh, a mechanism to reduce information information asymmetry in the marketplace. It's great for consumers; it makes the market more efficient, and other uh, economic uh, things that ec economists talk about, and I and I muddle through as a non economist. Um, so if if you if you say hey like the FDA you know exists to reduce a, information asymmetry in the, in the context of safety and efficacy it makes perfect sense that the FDA would exist uh, to reduce information asymmetry in the context of security right because should consumers like HDOs uh, physicians and patients be making uh, uh, judgment calls about whether this device is secure enough to treat me not really and and. While I, there are lots of uh, amazing folks doing amazing work for security within these spaces, within the consumer space, it seems kind of inefficient or ridiculous that you'd have to expend resources on that when we can more efficiently spend them uh, further upstream. So the regulator is a, a great place to start when we talk about uh, leveling information asymmetry, when we start talking about uh, re reducing security debt that these consumers have to manage. There's, there's a couple of fundamental problems and there's constraints uh, that we talk, talk about in the white paper are, are uh, 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 operational here. Remember this picture, what I just showed you a few slides ago, I came as a, from a chemistry background. 
that what, it, what, it mean, what I'm trying to say is that the folks at FDA CDRH are, are part of the healthcare uh, supply chain as well, right? They are optimized for healthcare. They're biomedical engineers, they're physicians, uh, right? And, and they're, they're, they are very good at what they do, uh, charged with a very important task, um, but it's suboptimal when you start, start talking about security because you need that expertise uh, and that, that's constraint four. Security requires a deep technical expertise to do well. It's not kind, security is not kind to amateurs like this guy on the screen. It's really also not kind to professionals. It's hard, very hard discipline. And to have a chance of getting it right, you have to specialize in it. And because we're all uh, optimized for healthcare, uh, we need to build out that core competency. It's just hard to do. It's hard to do for manufacturers, medical device manufacturers as producers in the space. It's hard to do for the FDA. Uh, as regulators uh, in the space, it's just a hard thing to do. Um, the uh, fifth constraint is that healthcare governance is fractured. So this is reproduced from the Healthcare Industry Cybersecurity Task Force Report of 2017. Basically gets to the heart of what I'm trying to talk about, and that is when you look at the healthcare space, there's a lot of people that have uh, power, uh, regulators that have power in the space. But when you think about the idea of, you know, while this these distinctions may make sense from a you know, technology or, you know, uh, part of the, the uh, uh, economy uh, aspect, uh, electrons, adversaries don't care about rel essentially relatively arbitrary uh, uh, regulatory jurisdictions, right? They, they don't abide by these bounds, right? So the idea that you have many, many people that are, are in the space, um, you've got ONC, Office of National Coordinator, Office of Civil Rights, um, uh, and FDA is, is three principal ones that are regulating sort of the technology in the space. There are gaps, right? There are gaps and you need a unified approach. I'm not saying that we need a uh, organization which sort of regulates, you know, a single organization that reg regulates the cybersecurity of healthcare technology. What I'm saying is in the current stage, this makes it difficult because you have a lot of different organizations that need to cooperate together. Um, the other point too, and, and, you, and we'll see that, we'll talk about the, the um, uh, 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 acts and, and laws that have been enacted uh, downregulating devices, uh, 21st century cures. Um, uh, you you see sort of pockets start to emerge. Like so, if you look at the PAC system picture, uh, uh, the the PAC system where uh, basically functions of the PAC system are either not a device anymore, like uh, storage retrieval. From a safety perspective or efficacy perspective, maybe we're not concerned, and we sort of get rid of those uh, because they just they don't need the extra special attention. Uh, that uh, uh, reg regulators uh, are putting on them, um, but they create these pockets of technology that then don't have that regulatory uh, uh, incentive from a security perspective. So you have this increased attack surface uh, and, and residual attack surface when we start to uh, carve out pieces of technology from the regulatory space. There's nobody to level that information asymmetry. Um, again, uh, not sure what the solution is, but I uh, just want to point it out. And the final constraint, six, the sixth constraint is computers aren't pills. Um, and it was really interesting when I started delving into the, the space, I found a couple of quotes from Jeff Shearn, who's the center director at, at CDRH. Um, and and uh, he, he said two things. One, we need to rethink the whole thing. And he was talking about uh, the regulatory model and, and sort of the, uh, I can't remember if these uh, Digital Health Center of Excellence have been announced yet, um, talking about Medufa 5 in terms of negotiating, you know, this we're struggling with our current regulatory model. Um, and then uh, the, the body computing conference out at U USC basically said uh, that the model isn't uh, fit for purpose. And I was like, whoa, wait a second, let's, let's tease that apart here. Um, and I'll, I'll give you the, the TLDR uh, that computers aren't pills. Um, and, and we'll delve into why that is in the next upcoming slides. But I thought this is really fascinating. Even the FDA feels the tension of, of, a, of a, a regulatory model that isn't fit for purpose, right? It's just, it's in the reason why it's not fit for, for purpose we'll get into today and that would uh, form the sort of back half of the talk. Um, but it's really interesting when you, as somebody who was there, um, I must have been really focused on the task at hand because I, I you'd think of like the, the, you know, I would have popped into Jeff's office and asked him a question like, hey, what, what you know, what, do you feeling any tension with the regulatory model? But, uh, you know, it's, it is what it is. Uh, but when you start to piece together the, the, the puzzle pieces, right, like when you, I worked on the post-market management cybersecurity medical devices, when we worked on the pre-certification program, right, when we were dealing with things like AI and machine learning and the multiple functions guidance, you start to see that there's a tension with the regulatory model that we're trying to retrofit or alleviate with policy documents. 
Like, and, and as I stated before, then you see 21st century cures. I think it's also dealing with a broken regulatory model. How do you fix a broken regulatory model? Well, if you don't have a good thing to replace it with, then I think you tend towards deregulation, right? And it, it's uh, unfortunate, uh, but uh, reasonable uh, in the absence of something else to replace it with. But then you look towards, uh, Jeff also said something about uh, the, the FDA Center, the, the Digital Health Center of Excellence is the future of FDA. Why? Because they're trying to construct through pre-cert and other programs that what that regulatory model might look like uh, and, and come to understand exactly that, that Jeff already knows this, right? That the computers are pills and, and, and it's attention, right? It's something that they have to deal with on a daily basis. So let's dig into the history part a little bit, uh, just, just for, to clarify for folks. Um, so when we think about where the, essentially the quality system regulations and things that we sort of abide by uh, as uh, stakeholders in this space, it really derives from a pill model called uh, Current Good Manufacturing Practices or CGMPs, or I'll call them GMPs for short. Um, GMPs are really uh, actually a, a, a fine model for pills when you're trying to actually control the uncertainty, uh, define risk, define benefit, and then be able to achieve some assurance of whether that thing, medical product, is going to be safe and effective, pills are, are what I would call a deterministic system. You can define all the inputs such that you can reasonably quantify the outputs and say something about uh, safety and efficacy. And, and the model works just fine. The problem is, is that we actually, uh, uh, and, and it's, it was a good start, 1978, right, after the act was signed in 1976, segregating uh, devices from pills, uh, we see the adoption, essentially whole cloth of C, uh, GMPs. Um, and then in, from 1990 to 1997, the center worked on sort of a uh, next step uh, for, uh, for uh, CGMPs, uh, codifying them in the QSRs. Um, I think design controls were probably uh, came about at that, uh, at that point in time. Um, but the thing is, is that they were largely derived from that deterministic system controlling risk and, and uncertainty. Uh, from a deterministic system. And you see, it, when you read the Federal Register and, and go through the comments, there's a lot of consternation about, uh, uh, about software. I mean, we're only five to three to five years removed uh, from uh, the Therac 25 uh, study, uh, case study, and we'll talk about that a little bit in the talk as well. Um, and you see that there's some, uh, there's some uh, tension around software. And I think, uh, not quite sure if, if people knew what was going on at that point in time or not, not quite sure. Um, but the idea is, is that even in its in, in, to, uh, 1997 instantiation, it's largely unchanged. It's not fit for purpose when you talk about computing systems for reasons that we're going to dive into in a second. The last thing that I'll say about uh, within the context of this uh, life cycle is that the use environment for pills uh, and, and the regulations that we have around that are actually coherent with the time scale at which problems manifest for pills. So if we take the example of like Vioxx, right? So Vioxx minus any manufacturer shenanigans, uh, you, if you have this, the first data point, right? Some person suffers a cardiac event because they're on Vioxx. Is that reason to recall? Has the benefit risk ratio changed? Is it still reasonably assured uh, in terms of safety and efficacy? The answer is most likely you need more data, but that data collection uh, timeframe is slow. So if you have mechanisms which are really sort of manual and require interpretation is sort of slow, um, it, they make sense. So I call it coherence, right? So the feedback mechanisms are coherent with time scale at which problems manifest in pills. The problem is, is that when you go to a device standpoint, there are a couple of things that happen. One in the pre-market, these are uh, software uh, uh, of sufficient complexity uh, and systems which uh, largely, uh, we are within uh, computing systems uh, comprised of many different assets uh, are not deterministic, non-deterministic. You can't define all the states, and therefore it uh, becomes a whole different ballgame in order to say something about reasonable assurance and safe, of safety and efficacy. And furthermore, the, the idea that you can essentially have a benefit-risk ratio that never degrades and never changes from the pill model is totally untrue for computer systems. There's emergent behavior, and we'll talk about that in a second turned the most rich data environment, the use environment, the post-market into a wasteland. In fact, uh, you know, and I use this anecdote often is, you know, some companies actually have uh, bonuses tied to the number of recalls, uh, right? Like if, the fewer recalls, the bigger your bonus, right? Which makes sense 
again, not pejorative, it makes sense when you're operating out of a pill model. But when you're talking about computing systems with emergent behavior, it's completely and fundamentally untenable that we would incentivize internally in the, uh, in the manufacturing space, uh, de-incentivize or perversely incentivize the idea of not changing. So we'll touch on a couple of uh, uh, reasons, uh, emphasize why uh, the, the, the model is broken. I'm talking about the Derek 25, which I did talk about in the original talk back in, at DEF CON, but I was sort of, again, the incoherent ramblings of Madman, which I may be doing now, but a little bit more uh, nuance on the idea that the problems that manifest at Derek 25, and again, if you're not familiar, basically under an over-radiating patient, um, the uh, manifestation of those symptoms, sometimes acute, sometimes you know, delayed. Uh, these are folks that already have cancer. They may be terminal. They may you know, be uh, curable. There's a lot of variables in that environment, but you had essentially these acute cases raising the, the red flag that there was something going on. Uh, AECL, the company that produced this, uh, the Therac 25, couldn't reproduce the error. The really fascinating uh, story actually went through the entire account by Nancy Levison up at MIT. Um, and it, it is really an interesting case study and actually shines a light on actually that we still have some of the same problems today because we're operating in that pill model. Uh, and what AECL and folks came to understand was that this was a system of, of sufficient complexity. We couldn't define all the states and that the software uh, was also contributing to that emergent behavior. You have emergent behavior, essentially uh, a, a, a boundary condition, right, that wasn't tested uh, before it was released on the market that you really needed to notice after it went on the market, but because we weren't optimized for these fast feedback mechanisms, the, the, the pace at which these were uncovered and fixed was too slow. Not to mention that, uh, and it's interesting because if you look at the, some of the comments from the FDA reviewers at the time, they basically said, yeah, I'm confident that when you take actions to fix this thing, that it will actually fix the thing that you've identified. What we are not confident in is it won't fix the things that we don't know about. And I think this is like a, a maybe Donald Rumsfeld read through this uh, account, and that's where he came up with his unknown unknowns. But it's a fact, in fact, what he's saying, there's emergent behavior. We don't know what we don't know. And that's the, that is the, um, uh, the reality that we're facing in a, in a software and system-based uh, paradigm. The other thing too, so this has had a couple of um, uh, impacts. So uh, this this idea that the, the pre-market is, is a deterministic system has led to some manifestations of sort of in the standards world, like ISO 14971. I love that, I love that document. When I first got to the FDA, I was like, where has this document been on my life? But I, what I've come to understand is it, it, it trades uh, uh, tr uh, fidelity for tractability, right? It, we can understand it, we can get our, we can assign our P1s and P2s um, and it, it does a nice job of actually calling out things like, oh, you know, if we have software, you need to back it up with data, or we have sabotage, which I'm equivalent to cybersecurity. And it, this, these are different. You have to assume failures of one uh, 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 and fix according to safety impact alone. But the fact is, is that systems are far more complex, and this has played out uh, fascinatingly in, in the channel, uh, Challenger explosion, where basically, uh, people were predicting the failure rate of the shuttle based on component parts, right? They were saying, hey, uh, you know, this component is going to fail, you know, you know, sometime out of a, some you know, denominator. Um, and then they were extrapolating that out, combining all the component failure rates and saying, how often would the system fail? And as evidenced by uh, Richard Feynman's uh, beautiful contributions to the Roger Commission report, which is the subsequent investigation of the explosion, basically says that this is, this is uh, crap, right? Basically that... It's, it doesn't work. You can't take component failure rates and extrapolate it out. Nancy Levison, I already mentioned, spent a whole bunch, and others have contributed, you know, spent their uh, parts of their career basically figuring out, well, what does risk management look like for systems? So we have this sort of old uh, way of thinking about systems and software that we need to change. Um, and there are uh, 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 other things that we can look towards in, in order to alleviate some of the, the burden here. Um, and, and perhaps, uh, the most vexing, right? And, and this is sort of what I've talked about before is, is contributing to this, is that, that we have to learn how to change, right? So whether we have a, a computing system uh, that's not connected, or we have a system that is connected, uh, and if we're paying attention, if, if the feedback me mechanisms are coherent with uh, the speed at, ne at network speed, at adversarial speed, we have to learn how to change at a rate that is coherent with that. 
Um, and it's interesting, like when you when I think back through the comments, which are public on the post market guidance, it was released, I think, in 2016, January 2016. When we got all the comments back, we, we had said, hey, if you fix an issue in 30 days, you know, this what X, Y, Z. Um, the comments were like, this will net, we can never essentially get to this 30 day thing, right? Because we're thinking in terms of we, we as an organization, our DNA has, is not set up to do change. So it was the most fundamental vexing part about uh, both the uh, cybersecurity, but also the idea that uh, the, the reasonable assurance of safety and efficacy with emergent behavior and the in the face of the adversary uh, erodes, it changes over time. So what do I mean by that? Um, so if you look at sort of a, a theoretical um, and sort of thought experiment, if, if we're thinking about the pill model, right? Pill model is deterministic. We can say that we can say something that about the reasonable assurance and say that that extends, you know, some arbitrary amount of years, 50 years, we'll say, which you know may be ridiculous. But we can we can get our arms around that. We can say uh, how fast a pill will degrade when it's stored at a certain temperature, right? Like, will it still be efficacious after a certain number of years stored at a certain temperature? We can get get our arms around that. So we extrapolate to that device. Same thing. The clinical efficacy, right, and safety. If we ignore a bunch of reality, will it will be the same. Right. If if it never gets attacked, right, it will be the same uh, as the day it was born. Um, <clears throat> if we assume, make assumptions about the software lifetime, that there are zero defects in software, which is delusional, right? So this is the non-delusional uh, part, um, or this is the delusional part that that the the lifetime, the reasonable assurance of safety and efficacy, will extend to that some arbitrary timeline. We'll, we'll call it 50 years. But then, as we start to think about, and we confronted this, and I'll get to this in a second. Confront, confront the actual lifetime of software that, first of all, is never defect free and even a release, and that the defects accrue as time goes on, and then you have emergent behavior. That the actual assurance of uh, reasonable assurance of safety and efficacy is actually as good as the, the lifetime, the actual lifetime of the software, which is really mind blowing, right? And I'm not saying that oh, we need to, you know, stop everything. And what I'm saying is this is this is reality, right? Like, and how do we contend with this is really the question. <clears throat> so. Um, I'm very proud of the work that I, I did at FDA. I continue to be proud of the FDA uh, for uh, essentially retrofitting and thinking about uh, breaking out of this. But essentially what we did with the policy documents, both post-market and pre-market, was to retrofit a broken model, right? And I, I remember the conversations happening at the time. Uh, some, I think people were talking about this, the folks that I was working with, and it just never sunk in, right? That you're, we're, we're trying to overcome some, you know, it's like, oh, we have this regulation. How do we... How do we work within that to create a model that actually works for cybersecurity, given all the things that we know about it? <clears throat> so if you look at the post market that came out first, what did it say? It said, hey, we need to pay attention to things that are going on outside. We need to have ways to deal with that information, uh, the, the security information that may be coming either indirectly to us or directly to us. We need to have a way of assessing it. And then we need to have a way of addressing it. Right? That's basically, in a nutshell, it says, and, and you know, it sets out some incentive uh, structures to try to fix that at, at the at network speed. Um, and, and then if we look at sort of pre-market, it said the, the 2018 document, what does it say in a gist? It says, hey, we have all these issues in post-market. How do we essentially reduce the uh, probability that those things will manifest in the post-market right? or make things easier to deal with in the post-market? So, we, we went over the, the constraints of the paper. Um, it was highly satisfying uh, to me to write, so I appreciate your uh, time and attention. Um, I'll just cover them just briefly. Uh, healthcare optimizes for healthcare. Uh, security debt accrues uh, for consumers. Uh, adversaries exist such that uh, problems manifest. Uh, it, security requires deep special technical expertise. Uh, governance for healthcare technology is fractured. And the FDA's regulatory model, specifically Center for Devices, uh, is uh, broken. Computers aren't pills. So I've presented, a, a, you know, went through maniacally a lot of data, uh, and we still have this situation. It's changing. It's changing. There's been a lot of tremendous progress for sure, right? Um, security debt is being reduced by lots of manufacturers. Um, I, I still think the market incentives are suboptimal. Um, we do have consumers that are basically saying, hey, we need something, uh, we need to reduce security debt instead of manage it. Obviously, the FDA is working on, and Congress have been contributing to, how do we uh, essentially take all this debt, right, and all the spending that are all the way to the right with the consumers, and how do we start shifting it left in the supply chain, or what I like to call supply chain shift left? And that is that we can take the same amount or less amount of investment, 
we can invest it in the producer side or in, in incentivize the producer side in such that when we get to the consumer side, that security debt is, is reduced. It's not eliminated, but it makes it far more manageable uh, for the folks that are uh, deploying and delivering healthcare. So let's 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 go through uh, what's happening right now. And it's a very exciting, it's a very exciting time. First of all, <laughs> hiring people at the FDA, and I'll I'll sort of key in on the FDA for obvious reasons. Um, uh, Jessica Wilkerson and Kevin Fu, they're higher at the FDA, right? Folks that don't have chemistry background, pity them, right? They actually have a technological uh, underpinning and, and focused in security. Um, that that's that is the start of that. Uh, unraveling the deep technical expertise uh, constraint. Applaud them for that. From a policy perspective, I can't wait for the the, the draft, draft, draft squared version of the, the guidance to come out. I'm really excited. I had worked on it uh, uh, prior to departure from the FDA. I think there's a lot of great stuff coming out, provided that it stayed the same, but I think really sound ways to help manufacturers communicate security information to the FDA. Um, Taking advantage of works that have already been done, so I point to the Hippocratic Oath for Connected Medical Devices from IM to Cavalry, really good framework for sort of what I call security objectives or properties, right? What do you want medical devices to do uh, at a high level? And then taking documents like from the HSCC, Healthcare Sector Coordinating Council, the Joint Security Plan, and looking at ways to sort of operationalize and start to get that muscle memory built within uh, manufacturing space and start to get your arms around this very difficult uh, issue. Obviously, executive or, uh, orders help. Um, there's historically a, a, a couple, a handful of executive orders that deal with uh, cybersecurity. Uh, most recently, uh, President Biden put out this one, basically, um, you know, po point to a few things that that are helpful. And that I, the the part that I took away from this is that it starts to move the bar towards the producer side. And I'll talk about that uh, as we go along uh, here. Um, obviously, SBOM was a big thing that that uh, folks talked about. Uh, coming out of that executive order, but executive orders help, laws help more. So if you look to the Medical Device Safety Action Plan uh, from 2018, uh, basically saying, hey, the FDA is seeking additional authorities in key areas, including SBOM, coordinated vulnerability disclosure, uh, updatability, patchability, um, and, and look towards just uh, last week, uh, the FDA continues to, to go down this path, which I think is good, basically saying, hey, we're, we're continuing to seek additional authorities. And I think they mentioned baselines or, or, or something like that. Um, in in that uh, article, uh, there was a law passed in late 2020, uh, the uh, uh, IoT Inter Internet of Things Cybersecurity Improvement Act of 2020. Again, it's starting to instead of put the burden on consumers, it's starting to move shift left, um, shift, shift supply chain left, shift the responsibility to the manufacturers who have the most uh, uh, the, the the most leverage to uh, reduce security debt in the things that they make. It doesn't make it any easier for reasons that we already talked, talked about, but it is starting to move that incentive structure in the right direction towards efficiency. And finally, um, what does a, a new regulatory model look like? And I, I hesitated to talk about the regulatory models broken in any depth because then, then the answer, the question comes back, well, Seth, what is, what is the new regulatory model? And the, the, the answer is, I, I don't really know. There, here's, a, here's a couple of things that it has to have. Uh, has to have. Uh, and this may, um, I may continue with this line of thinking for 2021, 20, uh, 2022. 20, so if anybody's interested in talking about this, uh, I'd love to uh, hear your thoughts. But first of all, we need fast feedback loops. We need feedback loops uh, that are uh, enabled by the technology that we're using to deliver healthcare features uh, at a time scale uh, uh, that uh, is coherent with uh, how problems manifest either on a cyber cybersecurity side, technological side. And when I say time scale, I mean uh, the, the metric that I like to use is. Um, the Wired article that covered the NotPetya attack that essentially knocked out a bunch of different uh, 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 industries, but <clears throat> specifically the Marist Shipping Company, it, I think they said 12 seconds basically from the time uh, the button was clicked basically until that entire company was uh, completely down, 12 seconds. That's, the, that's what I'm talking about in terms of coherence. <laughs> uh, feedback loops have to reflect that. Now, could we have done anything in 12 seconds? I don't know, but like, how do we start to take information that's happening and said that you know in network speed, so we respond at the speed of the adversary. Um, uh, uh, we, we need those, right? We need to incentivize that space. So if you look towards other models, uh, Adam Shostak and, and Co. put out an, uh, this paper about how we can leverage lessons learned in the aviation sector to start incentivizing how we report things uh, for cybersecurity in the healthcare space, um, which I think is a, a really good read, and, and and sort of provides some data, some ideas that we can use to construct this new 
a regulatory model. And then, um, well, not perfect, <clears throat> the idea that uh, I think in the es es essence of what we're doing or what a quality system regulation is supposed to be doing is, is sort of version control. And if we're th talking about version control with respect to software, uh, while imperfect, things like GitHub, things like um, uh, that there are technologies which basically understand who's touched the code, when it got committed, when did it go to production, um, how is it per per performing in production? Uh, there's all sorts of uh, technology that sort of enables us to understand uh, the space. Why can't we use that in healthcare space? So taking a page from how software is developed anyway and, and bringing that into our space. And finally, um, I, I think, so that, that was sort of the, the ideas on a, on a whiteboard uh, part of the talk. Um, we should certainly, I'm interested in hearing from folks about what they think a new regulatory model might include. The other idea that comes out of here um, is that we're gonna very soon be up against the, the, the question of how much security is enough. We're already asking that, I've already heard that from folks. Notice there's a question mark at the end of this title. So hopefully over the course of 2021 and into 2022, um, I'm able to come back to you in the same fashion about a year from now and answer that question. Because I actually, uh, I gave the talk asking the question at R RSA this year. Um, I do think we're going to need to answer that and, and happy to talk uh, to folks who are also interested in answering that same questions. Uh, and with that, uh, I'd like to say thank you uh, and ask if there are any questions uh, and, and then we'll field them now. I'm also good at um, just hanging out in the awkward silence. I will just busy myself with some paperwork. I'll be right back. I'm just joking. We got a question. Um, yeah, the uh, uh, question is what kind of data would we need to help quantify how things are, state of affairs, action going forward? Uh, uh, great question. I think uh, there's probably a lot of space for discussion in this, so I don't know exactly what we'd need. Um, you know, when I, when I think about <clears throat> how uh, I thought about this when uh, building out the pre-market uh, cybersecurity guidance 2018 version, um, we knew that we need to notice when things fail, right? And this actually is talked about in the Hippocratic uh, Oath for Connected Medical uh, Technology, um, that it's very hard to say that there's a problem, right? Or that we need to spend money on security features if we are missing the problems that are happening, right? And I use the example of, uh, and it's, it's probably cherry picked, but <clears throat> if, if I'm a clinician, in the middle of delivering healthcare and my device, Fusion Pump, whatever, blue screens, right? <clears throat> I don't know if Infusion Pumps are using Windows, but we'll, we'll go with it. Um, the blue screens, what is the, what is the likely action <clears throat> of the clinician, right? Um, it's probably like, give me another one, right? That that's probably makes sense because I'm, I'm in the throes of trying to, trying to do my job. <clears throat> does that blue screen get, does that get captured? Or where does that get captured? And does it feed back at a time scale that is coherent with you know, how we would need to use it or leverage that information so that we can make improvements to that device for whatever reason. Or if I lose network connectivity or you know, the, the thing reboots, right? Those types of things that are potentially innocuous, um, but also sort of hidden gold mines of information. Um, so the idea that we notice failures was really important and that we capture the data around those failures and we do something with the data around those failures. Uh, is that was the, of, of the essence from a cyber security perspective? 
um, you know, that opened up uh, the ability to say, and, and you see this all the time in disclosures, we have no evidence, right? Well, let's make sure that the evidence shows that uh, there has no, been no compromise. So that was the idea behind that. So a great question. Um, another question, uh, shifting cost to manufacturers at the front end, shift left. Uh, yeah, um, and it seems like there's still quite a bit of partnership involved in the solution. You, uh, would you agree better post-market information gathering response is a key capability we need to develop? Yeah, uh, it, it's a it's a great it's a great uh, point, right? Like one of the real struggles, and it's actually hard for folks to understand this. It's like, oh, well, you uh, so if you talk to people outside of the medical device space, like, oh, well, you sold that technology to a different company. Like, why why are you even why is it your problem? Um, and we know because we're in the regulated space, you know, it continues to be a problem. But so certainly, like you hear examples of um, we don't want outbound connection, right? Or you know, uh, and, and just you know, and this is this is, makes sense that you'd, uh, a person who owns essentially this technology would want control over that technology and say how it works in some some cases. So certainly like, uh, I think if you can incentivize, right, and show value of this data uh, to the delivery organization, for example, um, they may be uh, really interested in making those uh, outbound connections or uh, as an example, right? What they probably don't want is raw data about what's happening to that device so there's got to be some sort of filtration in between or like uh, interpretation in between whether that's manufacturer or otherwise um but i but i do think yes it, it's it's owned by somebody else which presents some complications uh certainly need uh, uh better uh, partnership um but i think we can look at ways to incentivize you know do you know sending that data channel up um and, and certainly that remains to be determined Do you have any thoughts on how FDA should revisit cybersecurity assessments with regards to the novel uh, SAMD uh, with AIML regulatory path proposed by FDA? Uh, I'll fully admit I'm, I'm not 100% familiar with the regulatory path that's proposed for AIML. Um, the, the challenge is, and I, I don't know where the FDA is on this at the moment, but that uh, my, my assumption, my presumption that uh, this idea that you can completely define the state of the machine, uh, which is essentially anathema to AI, Right, like the, the thing is learning and changing as it goes. Um, define the state, uh, it, it, and then the outcomes change. Like I get better at diagnosing, say, glaucoma. I think was the, the one that I remember uh, Google uh, coming out with um, by processing millions of images. Right, I change that way that that the state machine and how it actually functions. Um, I mean, from a cybersecurity perspective, um, you know, it, I, the. The vulnerabilities come from essentially four different areas, right? They come from architectural old uh, arch architectural uh, uh, choices. They come from implementation errors, whether that's your own code or somebody else's code, right? They come from configuration errors um, in sort of deployment uh, issues, and then and then from the maintenance regime, right? That how how are you maintaining that thing? So from a cybersecurity perspective, right? I would look for uh, even within that specific SAMD or AIML uh, paradigm, are there are there defects right that are resulting from those four areas, and that should be a part of your assessment. Probably how I could answer it from from a generic level, not knowing more. Any other questions? FDA has asked for additional leg legislative authority to enforce certain requirements around SBOMs, vulnerability disclosures, patching updates. When do you expect this to occur? And how do you expect HDS to put pressure on MDMs to meet these new requirements? Um, uh, great question. The, and I can easily answer that. And it, it's a uh, uh, getting legislation done uh, for the agency is a, a matter of political will uh, and the political atmosphere, right? So uh, the answer is it could be never. Uh, the answer is it could be uh, depending on political will uh, soon. <laughs> That's specific enough. Um, I'd be uh, really interested. If, uh, I don't know if I could put together a real poll, like what people thought the percentage chance was there, those legislative authorities would go in. Um, the, the the interesting thing is um, 
I, I do know that Medusa 5 negotiations are go ongoing right now. I obviously don't have uh, a window into that since I've left the agency. Uh, uh, but it would be really interesting to see um, part of Medufa 5 sort of help codify some of those legislative asks. Um, that, that's probably the easiest and most straightforward, uh, if, if, and I'm not saying it is straightforward, the most straightforward one other than say, pitching to Congress, uh, uh, sort of a, uh, omnibus bill or going in as, you know, on, as a writer or something like that. Uh, forgive my legislative butchering uh, on another bill. Um, so I, I don't know when, uh, and I don't know what the, the probability is that it will uh, come forth. And I, I think um, if it's law, I think the law will come direct, that will put the direct pressure on. So I don't necessarily think you'll need HDOs, uh, in essence, to put the, the friction on uh, MDMs to do so. Any other things? Cool. Well, uh, if you do uh, come up with something, uh, please uh, reach out to me at Seth at MedCrypt.co um, and certainly take a look at the white paper. Um, very interested in what folks think about it. Uh, so feel free to reach out. All right.